Hey guys, it's great to see all of you here. My name is Liva Parkon. Uh, I'm part of the organizing team of TechChill. I'm doing communications. Uh, one of the perks of being part of the organizing team is that you get to make the agenda as you would like to make it. So, uh, one of the things we do, we have shout out to my communications team, who are right now sitting on the third floor, uh, managing almost 100 journalists who are interviewing almost 100 speakers. Uh, but right now, uh, I'm going to introduce you to three journalists, very experienced tech journalists, and ask a few questions to them. So, let's switch this up a little bit. Uh, but meanwhile, how are you doing? How do you like it so far? Is it great? I hope you're having the time of your lives. I hope you had fun yesterday. And I hope you're going to have fun today during the night as well. Uh, but right now, uh, I want to welcome three amazing people. Uh, Monty, Stuart, and Victoria. Come here, guys. So I'm going to let you introduce yourselves, uh, and I'm going to start with the easy questions. Uh, give us a bit of background on you. How did you start in tech, writing about tech? Sure. Um, so I had, a, I had probably a very different route to this particular job uh, than a lot of people. I started out actually as an independent video game developer. Oh. Um, then I ran a whole bunch of software companies. And uh, eventually, I stumbled into being an analyst at VentureBeat, and uh, they liked my writing. And so I, I, uh, I took up the mantle of being a journalist. It's not quite that simple, because I never let go of the video game industry. It was something I, I stayed with. Um, and as a result, I actually created a multi-author news website that did uh, video game news. Um, I ran that entirely for charity. All of the uh, affiliate revenue, all of the advertising revenue was given away so that we could um, help fund amazing projects. And uh, that meant that we had lots and lots of people come and, and be uh, volunteers for that site. Um, they, they gave us their time for free. So I used to get press passes for video game events, and that's where I started to learn how to, uh, how to write. So how long have you been writing? Uh, approximately 123 years. Oh, that yeah. sounds about right. Victoria? Hi, yeah, so I am uh, currently a senior editor at Wired UK, where I work across uh, the print magazine uh, and the website, and also video now, too. Um, I think most tech journalists come one of two ways. Either they start off working in tech and then become a journalist, or they start off as a journalist and then get interested in tech. And I come from the opposite route to Stuart. So I uh, studied journalism, um, always kind of wanted to be a journalist. And then as soon as I started working professionally, I found myself drawn to tech and science as topics to cover, just because there's so much interesting stuff going on. Uh, those were the stories that I was most interested in. Um, so yeah, before joining Wired, I was technology editor at New Scientist. And before that, I was UK editor at Motherboard, which is Vice's tech and science platform. Monty? I'm probably not. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm probably not. A tech journalist like these two are. They're very good, and I'm not very good. Um, so I'm a writer, right? So I'm, I'm a failure, because I want to write books. Um, and I retrained as a journalist. I went around the world in 1994, and I wrote a book uh, with a Mont Blanc pen. I thought I was going to become famous, and I didn't become famous. So then I thought I had to learn to write. So I luckily got on a course in London at the London College of Printing, which was like three months course, two years work with an internship, um, and one of the, the internship that I wanted to go for was sports journalism, but someone said, go into tech journalism. I knew nothing about fucking computers. You know, I've been on the road for 20 years um, and all that. And then I went on a quick fast, 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 uh, different thing. Uh, so I'm just basically a failed writer um, that writes about technology because um, it's like being a music journalist in the 70s. Everything's free, and you have a fucking great time going to places like this. And occasionally I write a decent piece for the BBC or Forbes or The Economist. But I heard some rumor that you are in Bollywood movies. So you're two, basically famous. I was in two Bollywood movies. First, Both a villain. First one, I was an English villain with a moustache, looked very gay. I killed a gorilla leader dead. 
And the second one, slightly to type, I'm a Russian gangster. Uh, Russian? And I'm thrown in an, into an incinerator and burnt to death. I did 45 days filming, so it wasn't a joke. It was a big, funny thing. It's great. So how do you think the format has changed? Oh, we all know the format has changed. We have went from uh, mostly paper, media, and magazines, and uh, it has changed pretty qu quickly on behalf of digital. And now we see a lot of social, which comes with their, its own dark sides, like fake news. So how do you think that impacts tech journalism? How has that impacted your writing? Victoria. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the kind of core role of journalism um, hasn't changed as much as people maybe suggest. I think, you know, our job has always been and hopefully will always be to tell a good story um, to deliver news to people who want to read it um, and, you know, to give our readers the stories that we think they need to hear. Uh, obviously, the formats have changed with technology and social media has been, has had a big influence on that. Um, but I think, you know, maybe around five years ago, a little before, we saw a lot of new media outlets uh, start up that were basically designed around social media. They were making content specifically to go viral on Facebook. Um, you know, I think of things like Upworthy. Remember when that was yeah. everywhere? Every story in your newsfeed was Upworthy. Um, and I think we've seen in the past few years, those kind of outlets have sort of failed. You don't see them anymore because the problem is when you build a company that is completely dependent on the whims of a platform like Facebook or like YouTube, uh, you know, they can just tweak, your, tweak their algorithm and suddenly you're dead, basically. Um, so I think we're seeing less of that now. I think that has kind of stopped happening. But I'm seeing at the moment, I, and I'm sure a lot of people have noticed, uh, this pivot, pivot to video. So lots of sites are experimenting with, um, as, instead of doing written journalism or as well as doing written journalism, we're doing um, digital or online video. And I think that's great. I love video stories. I make video stories at Wired as well. Uh, I think it's great for the right story. Uh, but I think, you know, it becomes a problem if people are choosing the format um, to satisfy the kind of current whims of social media platforms. I think that's problematic. Do you think paper will die out? Yeah, I have this question. Interesting, is there a future for tech news on the radio? Uh, how do you think the formats will uh, change? Will some of them die out and some of them win out? Or is there room for all the formats? Back, back in the day when, uh, when I was doing consultancy, um, I did a year-long project for Trinity Mirror. And I Good went all God. across the country looking at what Trinity Mirror were doing in their national newspapers and in their regional newspapers. <laughs> And I had to work out exactly um, all of the algorithms, formulas, uh, everything that they were doing um, to basically build a, a new financial system for them because they, they needed to be able to estimate what was going to happen next. And what was interesting about that was that when you talked to the advertising um, forecasters, they had the most incredible algorithms. It was like you know, Russell Crowe in a beautiful mind. It was ridiculous. They had every single conceivable possible uh, mathematical formula in there to figure out what advertising looked like. The circulation forecasters, the people that are telling you how many people are actually going to read this paper, had the simplest algorithm in the world. They just reduced the circulation by 10% every year because they knew it was just going to die, and paper will eventually die. When you look at the newspapers that are out there and you look at their circulation figures, they're nothing like the reach that we have. Nothing I think, like it. I think there, um, I do think newspapers and magazines are a different thing. I think there is still a demand for the kind of proper lean back print magazine, enjoy the experience. Uh, it's going to die off. I mean, I, I, know, I know you're saying that because you're a writer. I've heard that you since before I studied journalism, and it hasn't happened yet. So I'm a believer. Yeah. I, I disagree with you. I mean, on it, that it one. will take a while because it's only 10% reduction. But tell me, tell me, but, I mean, if tell you me remember why, when, um, if you remember when iPad editions were a big thing, everyone mm. was getting instead of a print magazine, they'd get them on their iPads. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think that's kind of gone out of fashion, and people are returning to print for those more kind of luxury print magazines. I, I, I absolutely, absolutely agree with that, and I'm so glad you said it because I agree, agree with that. I mean, my blood is ink, right? But I was fortunate enough to retrain as a journalist when digital was kind of beginning. So I saw my opportunity that I'd been away for 20 years, I could catch up. So, so it was of great use to me. 
But I think it made becoming a journalist really easy. You know what I mean? That you could gear your content around clickbait and headlines. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Fleet Street sub-editor. It took me years to do that. I love that job. You know, that's gone. You know, and I don't want it to be a kind of like, oh, God, it's all going. There's always going to be space for people to think slowly. You know what I mean? And just, I mean, I sat on the plane here and I read the Times from cover to cover, which I don't have the time to do. It was absolute joy. It's amazing. It's like listening to vinyl or, you know, anything like that. There will be a niche, and I think it will probably be a niche of smart people that use and, and read print. I don't think it'll be idiots, you know You're what I mean? You're calling yourself a smart person. I'm there. fucking <laughs> calling myself a smart I'm calling you a smart person. I'm not sure about you. We've, we've never been sure about each other, Monty. I, I think, actually, fun fact, ink is actually uh, 100 times more expensive than blood, which makes you a very rich man. Is if, that a fact? That's right. Printer ink, yeah. printer ink is now more expensive than Chanel Number no. 5. Yes, it is. Yeah, quite, quite extraordinarily. Now, I, I, I think your point earlier to the fact that we're pivoting to video is, is very interesting, because we are doing that. Um, I find it interesting that uh, we are coming up with new mediums all the time to deliver our news. And one of the things that the iPad editions did was basically give you an electronic version of something that already existed in another form. Whereas what we're seeing now is new forms of delivering the news as opposed to just copying it and making it a digital version. So, you know, I think as we continue to evolve, um, we will move more and more and more into digital. It will take a while. It's, this is kind of, it's, you know, whenever you start to, to look at these things, regardless of uh, the, the speed of changing technology, if there's something that changes culture, then it still takes a generation to bed in. So we're, we're a long way away from getting rid of paper but absolutely, I mean, with all the best uh, will in the world, Monty, you know, a sample of one is not statistically significant. So if, uh, if we look at the actual two. data, we can see it going down and down and down and down and down. And of course, you've seen all of the layoffs in the media recently in the regular newspapers and some of the other magazines. I think it was a friend of ours. I think it, I think it might have been Chris O'Brien on Facebook. Um, and he was basically trying to work out the redundancies around the Bay Area, San Diego Tribune down in uh, San Diego, clearly. LA Times and this huge metropolitan kind of, well, metropolitan kind of, you know, hu huge state area and how many journalists were left covering the, one of the most vibrant places in the world. And that doesn't just mean a tech journalist writing about a new startup. It's like a, it's a young journalist going into a court and watching a court and reporting on a court case. And I know you're right about print and all that stuff, and I know there is optimism also um, about its replacement. But don't you think there's the, the, the fourth estate or journalism as a way of protecting us from governments, the very fact that the descent of print journalism has created this very strange post-truth, back to your subject, fake news world, those two things have got to be connected, right? It's terrible. Has that... Um we see that tech in itself has become a lot more powerful as well in the recent years. That right now, I think four most valuable companies are in tech, which wasn't the case uh, just a short while ago. And has that changed the role of tech media as well, where it's actually kind of the main media, the mainstream media. You write about Facebook or Apple and Google, and it's front page news. It's not the tech, uh, the tech news. Uh, it's the front page news. So has that also changed kind of the power of tech media that you're not reporting on something kind of, it's not a, a tiny geek event uh, where a few startups gather, it's actually the most valuable companies and stories that come out of that companies. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as you say, these, if you're writing a story about you know, Facebook or Apple or Google or whoever, that's no longer a story just for a, a niche tech blog that is front page of international newspapers. Um, and I think, it also has meant that tech has become a lot more political. These tech companies play a huge role in uh, our, our daily lives, our political lives, our social lives. Um, and I think that also puts uh, more responsibility on journalists to hold them to account. You know, if it's not enough, I think in the early days of, um, you know, tech journalism and especially the kind of digital outlets, there was a lot of championing of tech 
and that's great. You know, everyone here is very excited about technology. That's why we're here. But I think it is also, um, I worry sometimes that these huge tech giants have too much power and too much control. Um, and, you know, I do see that it's our responsibility to, to keep that in check and to find the stories that maybe they don't want to be told as well as the ones that they do. You know, everyone gets really excited about things like you know, SpaceX sending a Tesla into space or whatever, and that's great and we can be excited, but we, all, we also need to do the uh, kind of on the ground um, investigative reporting. Too. But, but, but don't you think there's a little bit of sign that, that, that these things have been sorted out a bit? You know, fake news is what we say it all the time. Uh, Facebook, you know, money to publishers. I do get a sense that it's kind of gone past the worst, you know, and it's it, it's an optimistic future. And no, that that ridiculous power is going to ebb away slowly by regulation. I, re I, I really do think that, and I'm, I think it's peaked. Hopefully, you think it's peaked, but uh, the boring company just launched a flamethrower for no reason. <laughs> well, well. I mean, <laughs> no answer to that. I mean, it, this, is the, this is the thing. I mean, I, I, I completely agree. We have to still hold these people accountable. I don't think we've got to a point where they're, they're not going to do something really stupid. And we have to be able to call that out. I mean, the, we're talking about people that have incredible power, not just incredible power from a, a, a political standpoint, um, not just incredible power because of the sheer amount of wealth that they have. Um, but look at what these big companies have done to various regions of the world. I mean, San Francisco is now, I believe, the single most expensive place to live in the entire world. And I remember seeing an Airbnb listing. Um, it got taken down pretty quickly, um, but it was an Airbnb listing for a crawl space uh, that uh, could fit a, an, an airbed in it, and somebody was trying to rent that out for $750 a month. <laughs> Um, as an actual space for you to live in. And, you know, this is the kind of thing that's, that's happening. Um, San Francisco actually has, and I go there a lot, um, the widest gap between the haves and the have-nots I've ever seen outside of the third world. Because you have huge companies there that are generating huge wealth, dragging, you know, huge amounts of people there to, uh, to try and make a difference, make it in the world. Um, but as a result, it's having a desperate impact on the, uh, on the economy, making all the prices rise, making the have-nots... Uh, you know, even worse than they ever were before. Do you and, think the media you know, has uh, should call them out more? Yeah, I absolutely do. I don't think we do, you know, necessarily, you know, call these call these things out as much as we should. We're we're driven a lot of times by, um, you know, the fact that they send us a press release. They've got some shiny new object coming out, and we need to cover the product or the funding announcement or something along those lines. Um, you know, I think we need to call them out in terms of the impact that they're having and, and maybe the fact that they're not necessarily uh, redressing that or, or paying for the impact that they're generating. And we should also say that although these big companies have a huge amount of power, they are incredibly untransparent. So, um, you know, journalists obviously should also hold, for example, governments to account, but often there's a lot more transparency there and you actually know what's going on. You know, when you talk about Facebook, Google, Apple, they, they really don't publicize much of, what they're, of what's going on. You know, you, you see again and again recently with the debate around fake news, no one actually knows what they're doing to tackle fake news. No one even knows how their algorithms work. Only they know. It's proprietary. Um, so it is difficult to get to the truth on these, on these topics, but that's why it's even more important, I think. But, but I think, th I think ch things changed really quickly, right? So about five years ago, the last... US election, I think I wrote it for Liv at Wired, actually. Sorry, it was TechCrunch. And it was about um, one of the Saatchi sons went over to the US and wanted to get Obama re-elected. And they basically told him to go away because they were, you know, they were full. Um, but he came up with this other guy that they were going to do a Facebook clone for all of the campaigns in all the different states called National Field, right? And a lot of, the, I think, one of the reasons that, that, that Obama got in the second time is because they had this great technology that was based on Facebook that was called National Field that was sold commercially afterwards, right? And I thought it was a really amazing story about getting information and using information. I'm clearly more of a Democrat than I'm a Republican, do you know what I mean? Five years later, we're in a mad world, you know, and hopefully it will chill out. But maybe they are being held to account now. Maybe there is people are starting to think, do you think, know what, yeah. I've had enough of this shit. I think there's an acknowledgement, I think there's been a, a bit of a shift very recently in public opinion 
um, where people have started to question more the role of um, these tech platforms in our lives. I think that's, yeah. that's just what the are they What are they doing to us? Perception. Oh, I've just realised. Yeah, I'm only getting that because of that, and I'm in Plato's cave, and I don't want an echo chamber. I want debate. I want to live like a human, you know, not just get this fucking silage pushed towards me, you know. And I, I, I really think that there is a, there, there is a kind of high polite or a movement against what they're doing to us. So, um, there has been uh, so many uh, formats and so many channels, like right now everyone can, can be media, everyone can write, it's so hard to check, uh, which is probably one of the reasons why also fake media or just uh, not very high quality media have appeared. And uh, do you think, is there a solution on how to filter it? Is it just hoping that the best, uh, highest quality article will filter through to the people? Because we have seen in the, I think, especially uh, it's most visible in the elections, both sides of the pond, that we have seen people kind of living in this bubble where they, what they get is what they already think, uh, the news that reinforce their opinions. Do you think there is a way out of, we see that the tech, uh, big tech companies, as you just said, they're not that, um, proactive in solving this? Do you think there is, there is a solution? It's, it's interesting, you know, when we think about fake news, we think about these, these issues. Um, we've already, you know, explained the reason why it's happening because we've, we've relied so much on social media. It's very easy for people to manipulate that. Um, we've seen what happens uh, when you can use really interesting audience targeting. Uh, because it's very hard to change the opinion of somebody that's very left or very right. But when they're hovering around the center, it's possible to use fake news to shift their opinion. And that's definitely been happening. Um, we don't know how the, uh, the, the people that spread this news, the Twitters, the Facebooks, the, the Googles of this world, are trying to solve that. Because as uh, Victoria said, it's all proprietary. But there is another side to the fake news as well. And it's happening elsewhere. It's happening right now in, in blockchain technology. Um, so it's not just with uh, the mainstream media. And, you know, we've certainly been affected. I mean, I've, I've certainly had people say to me, how do I know what you're saying is real? Because they associate mainstream media and us and put us all in the same bucket. But even in blockchain technologies, you'll see that a piece of news comes out about uh, the latest solution and their ICO. And immediately, a whole bunch of people will create a completely fake uh, information in order to create fear and uncertainty and doubt in that ICO in order to reduce its value and stop them from making so much money because they're in competition with them. And this is happening all the time right now. I, I don't see a really, um, a really good way of fixing that at this moment in time. I don't see anybody that's out there actually trying to really work out this. I've, I've got a, a Chrome extension that I've got on my machine that I've been testing that supposedly uses natural language processing and artificial intelligence to tell me the likelihood of this being real or not. Um, oh, it's but it's not very good and it doesn't work very well. And I just don't believe that we can trust in most people to sit there and actually do fact checking to see whether this is real or not. Yeah, but there are other ways, right? You know, like extremists, generally unintelligent and passionate, and extremists can't spell. <laughs> they don't understand grammar. You know what I mean? So it's a very easy thing, even if, you don't, even if you're not trained in grammar. You can easily look at a page and just run it through some Google, something like that. You know, you, if you can't spell and if you can't put a sentence together, you should have the fucking right to send out any news. I yeah, completely I mean, uh... disagree with that. <laughs> How? <laughs> um, because there's so many biases that would go into that. That's insane. Um, but I think, and I think in any case, the point is, um, in terms of stopping this problem of fake news spreading online, I think it, lots of people are working on technological tools, like the plugin that you use, like, um, you know, things that Facebook and Twitter have suggested, or it's rumored that they're working on flags that could maybe come up and say, you know, this, is dis this fact is disputed. Um, I think, first of all, it is a very difficult problem to do technologically. Um, you know, you can throw NLP at it, you can throw machine learning at it, but who decides what is true? I mean, that ultimately is actually a very, very difficult question. And I, for one, don't really want Mark Zuckerberg to be the one doing that. 
Um, and it's something that, you know, fact checkers and journalists have been working on for ages, and it's, it is really difficult. I don't think you're going to find a technological progr program that can, with enough accuracy, say, this is fake, this is real. And even if you could, you could get something that was 100% accurate and could pick out, uh, you know, what we would say was fake news. I don't think it would have any effect, because if you're scrolling down your news feed, um, and you believe one thing, and you see a story, and it's got a flag on it that says, oh, you know, this fact is wrong, what are you going to say? You're just going to say, eh, fake news. Like, it's not just a technological problem. I think it's also a social problem. It's a political problem. Um, and I think often we kind of, I mean, I know I've spent a lot of the, the past kind of half an hour um, being a bit down on the big tech companies, but I think in the fake news debate in particular, um, people are kind of pointing to these platforms as the problem because it's easier than looking at the broader social and political issue. And yeah, it would be great if we could come up with like um, a plugin or a bot or whatever to solve the problem. But I don't think it's that simple. I think it's But do you think it's unfixable? Issue. I mean, I, I, I'm kind of with you both there. I don't know how it can be done, how it can stop. It's, this is the new normal. I, that, that's what is. Also and I, th I mean, I think readers also have a responsibility, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Do you think absolutely. the government should be involved at some point? Because uh, well, obviously, usually media has to be free. Not not usually, but it has to be free. But at the same time, we have seen so many cases where media or fake news have uh, had a very big impact on politics, on changing elections, or at least it's assumed they had an impact. It's hard to say. Uh, so, uh, is there a point at which the government should get more involved and maybe regulate? Because we already see that Facebook has trying to yeah, get this responsibility from them, but at the same time they control these algorithms and uh, you get that bubble, so they have this control. Yeah, so I think just yesterday British MPs were actually um, tackling uh, Twitter and Facebook um, and some other companies, I can't remember them all off the top of my head, uh, on this issue of fake news and really pushing them on what they have been doing to look into uh, potential interference in the, um, the European referendum vote, so um, yeah. Brexit. Um, so I think they, you know, they are trying to intervene where they think that something that you know, affects uh, democracy is happening, and I think that is their role. I think, you know, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I wouldn't want to say that you know, government involvement should go too far, but you know, if there is an issue happening that is kind of threatening um, you know, the laws in a country or the democratic process, then yeah, obviously. Monty. Absolutely. But I, I'm, again, I'm quite optimistic that I think the, the, the meddling in recent elections, um, I also think that's not going to happen again. I think that's going to be fixed. I don't. I don't. Th I think, as so I'm saying, I, I do think that there's a, there's a line that's been crossed within the powers of the, and the courts of the world that this is fundamentally screw things up by this type of meddling. You and think I, that won't happen again? I don't think it. Will, I don't think it will happen in. For it, well, I don't think it will happen next time Trump gets elected. Unfortunately. Okay, that's. Uh yeah, okay, I'm going to ask one question from, um, uh, from the audience on um, do you think there is a future on artificial intelligence in media? Do you think it can that, replace the journalists? Are, are we going to be replaced by robots? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, actually, I think for uh, kind of straight news reporting, uh, AI can already do that quite well. So things like uh, weather reports, sports results, um, breaking news headlines. Um, I like to think that maybe my job is safe because I write, I tend to write kind of longer pieces for magazines which require things like color and scenery and um, interviews with people. Um, and I'm not convinced that AI is ever gonna have that kind of level of creativity um, necessary to, to, to create those kind of stories. Uh, agreed, and I think the reason I swear too much is because AI is not gonna be able to swear. And you I'm think no? Well, you can program it to swear. <laughs> you can, can program, program it to replicate you? your. Uh... <laughs> yes, we we can actually create a chatbot of your conversations right now and make it sound exactly like Monty Mumford. Then you I mean, realise how shallow I am. 
<laughs> AI is really interesting because it's already affecting our daily lives. There are lots and lots of publications out there already that you might not know are actually written by um, artificial intelligence. And uh, Victoria picked up one of the, the really top categories for that, which is sports news. Um, a lot of the sports news right now is completely written by bots. Um, and it does a remarkably good job of it. But I do think that for the kind of reporting that we do and the kind of human stories that uh, we try to tell, um, it's going to be a very long time before AI can replace us. So hopefully, we'll all be dead by the time it does. And we are, we are all storytellers in our own way, and creativity and storytelling will persist more than most things, I think. Okay, so last question uh, for the, all the startups attending. How to pitch you? Sorry? How to pitch you? Um, I'm sure you get that question a lot. <laughs> How to pitch me? Uh, well, very easily. Um, have, a, uh, have a compelling pitch and send it to me via any mechanism that you like. I'm probably one of the only journalists who uh, will be happy to receive your pitch via Snapchat if you want to send it to me via that. So, yeah, um, you should you know, I, I teach actually me don't that. care. The most, most important thing is do your research, make sure you know what I write about and don't send me off-topic pitches because that's uh, the one way to get me to completely ignore you very quickly. Yeah, I'd say um, the two things that I tell everyone, whether they're uh, a company trying to pitch their product or a writer trying to pitch to write, um, my two questions are always, uh, why should wired readers care? And why should wired readers care now? Um, so what, it, what is the story? Why is it really important to the lives of our readers? And why do they need to know about it right now? What has happened? What is about to happen? Um, that means it's really timely. Yeah, and, I, and on a more pragmatic basis, if you can imagine our inboxes and how much we receive it by email, have a very compelling subject line uh, write about three or four paragraphs. In the first paragraph, tell me how awesome I am, what a lovely writer I am, how much you enjoyed my previous article, because most people have never read anything that I've read. Then have a very compelling one paragraph about it, and again, finish off that with what Victoria's just said, and then you're in the door. And then you might get a call, and then you might get published. But it's all a question of, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a company and you're trying to sell your products and research in your market, research your journalists as much as anything else. What they're writing about. Don't pitch Victoria something about something she's not writing about. Has never written about. Stuart's probably written about everything anyway. But, but you know, but, ju but just, it just takes some time doing it, you know. Be, be smart about it. And, and don't whatever you do, try and send journalists gifts. We can't accept them. Um, if we're going to do that, let's go big or go home. Send me a Lamborghini. I'll quit the next day. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, guys. On that note. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It's amazing. <laughs>